Stuff Podcasts. A warning, this podcast contains references to subjects and discussions that could be hard for some people to hear. So please take care when you're listening. Why are we beating ourselves up about this shit? Like, I'm sorry, but I'm kind of sick of hearing myself like, oh my God, I could have done the thing. Like, where are all the men? Queenie, queenie, don't drop the ball. Queenie, queenie, don't drop the ball. Queenie, queenie, don't drop the ball. Down come baby, cradling on. Kia ora and welcome to Tell Me About It, the podcast where we interrogate the levers of power so you don't have to. I'm Michelle Duff. I'm Kirsty Johnston. And I'm Noelle McCarthy. And this week, Kirsty, it's your story. And it's like the personal and the professional intersecting in the most awful way possible in this story, eh? Yeah. Um, have you ever found out someone you trust is a sexual predator? Because um, that's what happened to me. And what I really remember, like the, the key feeling to come away from it is just the sinking disgustingness that I felt. Uh, yeah, I know it. I know it well. And actually, we put a call out on social media because that's, um, to say that's what we were talking about this week. And that's what really came through for people. Uh, just that hideous kind of stomach dropping sensation. Uh, we had someone who had a boyfriend who found out that his nickname was The Predator. And another woman who had an uncle acquitted of rape who she couldn't even bear to be in the same room as at at family dinners. I had one of those too. You know, somebody um, messaged with a similar story. So, you know, people with family members who did similar things to that. And also someone who messaged saying in their industry, in their specific industry, they had a peer who was a teacher who was working with a lot of young women in particular. And as it turns out, they were preying on um, on their students. Ugh, so we're going to come back to this a little bit later. Um, and the burden of what happens when you find out that someone you know is a sex pest and what you mean to do about it. Like, you know, the guilt of feeling like you should have known and how you should act, I guess. Let's talk about the story we're going to focus on to explore this first, because it's your story, Christy. And you were in this extraordinary, like it seems absolutely wild position of actually being able to do something when you find out that somebody you know is a sexual predator because of being a journalist, right? Tell what what, what happened. So um, in 2019, I was working at the New Zealand Herald um, and I'd been writing a whole bunch of stories about rape at the time Um, and in the midst of that I was just sitting at my desk one day and I got a call from a source who told me um, that a man I knew had been arrested for um, raping an elderly woman in a rest home and that man was actually yeah (laughs) that man was actually my journalism professor and Michelle's journalism professor um, Grant Hannes Um, so he it turned out later, had been caught, like, in this room with this woman. She was in a wheelchair, and he was, like, on top of her. And it was really lucky, like, a worker just happened to go in the room and find them. Um, But it was horrific. Like, the woman didn't really want to talk about it at first, and eventually she did. And, yeah, I, I remember when I found out, I called the Ministry of Justice. Like, you can ring and just check the details of the charges so I did that and sat there through like the kind of peppy hold music um and then because that's yeah, exactly what it. you need when you're stressed <laughs> out of your mind to steer a crowded house on <laughs> top <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm yeah, no, no so, shade to crowded house I love crowded house but yeah and then I think yeah got it confirmed went to the work bathroom vomited and then just kind of went outside and sat there for ages just kind of thinking about <sighs> what what I was going to do. Yeah, and I think the context is important here too, right? I think this was at the beginning of me too. So everyone was starting to think about things a little bit differently and people were sort of being revealed as sexual predators. Which isn't to say that you expected that it would happen to you, yeah. people, you know, be people that you knew so well. And not only like, so so you're thinking about what you should do, Kirsty. Is that because, like, was he your actual 
tutor or teacher? What was the, um, did he like grade your papers and stuff? What was the relationship when someone's your journalism professor? So um, journalism is a really small cohort. Um, Back then at Massey, they only took 20 or 30 people a year. So you're in the same class with the same people all the time. You have the same lecturers. I mean, we saw Grant every day. Um, He was actually also my kind of tutor group leader. So I would get him to check my work in kind of a close manner. Um, I went to his house for dinner at the end of the year. Um, We went on a marae stay with him. Actually, in hindsight, a little bit weird. Like, he got into his undies. I remember they were red. Like, he was just, like, in his (laughs) red undies on the marae, like, not wearing PJ. I mean, maybe those were his PJs. But, yeah, so, like, I knew him really well. And, like, even after I left journalism school, um, he would always, like, ring me. I'd see him at events, that kind of thing. So I would say we were friends. Like, is this the same for you too, Michelle? Because if he was your professor as well, was was your cohort small as well? Yeah, it was this. I mean, I went to journal school the year before Kirsty, so it was a similar situation. And I, yeah, I kept in touch. Like, oh, I had actually emailed him like two months before this story kind of broke, uh, suggesting that he include a chapter about sexual violence and Me Too in the journalism textbook, which... He had written. (laughs) He wrote the textbook. Yeah, he wrote the textbook on journalism. Uh, He's a big deal. He's a big deal. Yeah, so journalism ethics, you know, like how you should approach people, what you should be thinking about when you tell a story. He used to edit all of our work when we were students. So, Kirsty, you're saying like when you got the information, when you find this out, And you go to the work toilet and you vomit and, you know, you're thinking about this. Were you thinking about whether or not you should cover the story? Like, ethically, what what are you supposed to do in a situation like that where you know the person and you've been on a Marai trip with him and, and, you know, you have that relationship? Well, I think generally you wouldn't cover it but um at the time it was like well every single journalist here is going to have some kind of conflict of interest with him I mean probably not to the extent that I did but I remember just thinking I really want to do this story like I'd been writing about this issue a lot and I knew that I could do a good job and it was like some kind of I don't know it was like some kind of guilt thing I just felt like I personally needed to do this to kind of make up for it in some way I don't know so yeah I did I did decide to do it and I talked to my editors and they didn't really seem to have an issue with it either (laughs) they were just like yeah okay go ahead that's quite interesting isn't it just go for it yeah (laughs) how did you how did you find out about this Michelle did you just read the story oh no I think you called me didn't you Kirsty yeah like in the cone of silence with just like you guys and um I guess our podcast listeners (laughs) I was like in just a really weird space and I just I didn't know what to do like the Mato reporting had only just started and it was really difficult and I didn't know who I could talk to about it because I didn't know who was also working on the story like when you work on those pieces you really don't know and you get quite paranoid and it was just really weird so Michelle and I used to talk on the phone all the time anyway despite working for rival media outlets um so I rang her and I was like I just I just need to talk to someone about this and, yeah, let her know what I'd found out. What was it like for you, Michelle? It was I just felt ill. Just actually, you know, Kirstie, you said you vomited. Physically ill. Just thinking that how – the main question for me was, like, how didn't I know? And if someone Mm. that I worked so closely with and respected, like a mentor, could do something like this to someone – uh, I just thought he had people's best interests at heart because that's kind of like what journalism is to me, and he didn't. And I just felt like, do I need to reevaluate everything in my life and every uh, you know interaction that I've had with another human? And you must have been feeling like that too, Christy. I mean, you must that must have been you must have been maybe a, a few steps ahead in that process, but the same emotions. Yeah, it was so confusing. I mean, like, afterwards when the story was published and his name came out, which was quite a lot later, um, a lot of people were saying, oh, yeah, I always knew he was a creep. Um, And that was so – it was frustrating because that wasn't actually my experience, or I don't think it was Michelle's experience, of him at journalism school. Like, he was eccentric um, and he was kind of pedantic and strange. But – And got in his undies 
a yeah, class trip. But, like, we didn't find him, you know, offensive in any way, I don't think. I mean, as we'll find out later, um, a journalism student from that year, from 2019, was actually beginning to investigate him for bullying women in her class. So, obviously, right. then, you know, later he was different, but that wasn't our our experience of him. Yeah, so I totally would total call that. We kind of just felt like why, what, yeah, what do people see that we didn't see? Like maybe there were some red flags earlier and we should have acted or like we were just not that onto it. But Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the thing, isn't it? Like this is, this is how the ground shifted with Me Too. You know, you're having this massive revisionism, like looking back on everything that you thought was a certain way. I mean, I have teachers, I have, you know, old boyfriends, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's everybody, you know, you re, you, you sort of reassess every relationship, like a kind of a revisionist history of your own life. Yeah, totally. And I, I also sort of think like, sometimes there aren't really obvious red flags, like, you know, uh, by by sort of insinuating that it was really uh, like for everyone, you know, that that it should have been really obvious. It's like, well, not everyone who's a rapist is a monster. They people don't present like that, you know. It's people that you know who otherwise are normal. You know, you can't necessarily mm-hmm. pick it up. And I, why do we feel like we have to all the time? Yeah, because people know. don't have you know horns and and a spiky tail. That's exactly the DMs that we were getting. You know, this is it's boyfriends, it's family members, it's people that you love, and you know your loved ones. Yeah, yeah, it's people often that you see every day. You know, and sometimes it's people who have power over you, or it's not. They're just in your life, and so it makes it really complicated to do anything about it. I guess especially if it's going to impact you, you know, directly, it's going to, like, these are the people that you maybe are part of your family or your friend group or yeah. that you work with. So it's not, it's, you know, going to have a, it's going to affect your life. For me, like, the stakes, to be honest, weren't that high. Like, I, Grant wasn't in my personal life. Like, yeah, he was someone I knew and it made it more complicated and it was our industry, so that was difficult. But other than wanting to do a good job, it wasn't, like, that bad usually in these situations it's really messy and painful and traumatic Mm. um which um actually describes pretty much the experience of the woman who is our guest today her name is emily rosenthal she was working on a story at massey investigating bullying complaints so she's like in the class with grant so hang on you're both doing parallel stories about Grant Hannes. You're looking at this in secrecy. You're looking at this rape charge. And meanwhile, Emily is looking at bullying complaints. Is that right? Yeah. And Emily didn't know that there was this rape charge going on until somebody kind of told her, they were like, are you, do you know about the thing? And she's like, yeah, I know about the thing. And they were like, oh my God, isn't it disgusting? And she's like, hang on, wait, what are you talking about? And they were like, wait, what are you talking about? So she found out in that way. Um, but she didn't really ever report on the rape story. She mainly kept following these bullying allegations. Um, but it was, you know, it was hugely at stake for her in doing that. So she talked to us and she talked to us for um, ages, actually. And we talked about lots of lots of different things, didn't we? But um, in the part of the interview, what, what's she going to talk about in the part of the interview that we're going to play, Kirsty? So she's going to talk about how she investigated these bullying complaints and the impact it had, like we were talking about, the impact it had on her life. So this is Emily Rosenthal. Emily was doing postgraduate study in journalism at Massey University when she started looking into bullying complaints against Grant Hannes, as Kirsty says, made by some of her classmates. And she was writing stories about these bullying complaints by her classmates for the New Zealand Herald, where Kirsty was also working at the time. Emily was the only person besides Kirsty who knew about the rape charges that Grant Hannes was facing. None of her other classmates knew he was on trial. And she's going to talk in this clip about her experience of going to the court to see if he showed up for his appearances and also how she weighed up the decision of whether or not to tell her classmates 
and Grant Hannes's employer, Massey University, what was going on. I had transitioned to um, doing my master's in journalism. And so that first year that I was being taught by Hannes, um, I was completing the postgraduate diploma. And um, before that, I'd sort of done a bit of research and sort of journalism stuff on the side and was interested in developing my skills in that area. Um, and yeah, that's one of the things that also made it a lot more complicated. One of the reasons I did the um, course in the first place was because I um, got a research grant to study um, the topic that eventually became my master's. And that was, you know, really present in my mind when I was doing the story because I was felt like I was throwing the department under the bus and I was like, oh shit, they're going to take away all my money. Like, what am I going to do? So it, it wasn't easy. And why did you decide to pursue it? Um, because men have gotten away with this stuff for far too long and it's about time they face consequences for their actions. Um, it was really close to a lot of stuff I'd experienced that year. Um, I helped run the investigative journalism conference and that year I had chaired a um, panel with um, Alison Moore and Louise Nicholas and Melanie Reid and we were talking about that. Earlier in that year as well, I was supporting someone very close to me who was going through, um, who was trying to press charges against someone for sexual violence. So it really felt like I just couldn't get away from all the stuff and that I had um, a choice to make. And but you were really putting everything on the line. You know, you're putting your livelihood, you're putting your future research. There's not that many places in New Zealand where you can do what you were doing. You know, Massey's an important place. That must have been a big choice. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. I remember like sort of writing pros and cons list. I got in touch with um, my mentor. So I'm I'm quite good friends with Nikki Hager. And I remember him and I went into the forest for four hours and just talked through every single point of the sit, like what could go wrong, what could go right. Because by at that point, we were also working out like um, – kinks in the story that we hadn't resolved yet in terms of whether or not the department knew about the charges. There were like all these layers to it that um, we were not very close to solving but at that stage, but it really, it was a hard one. And um, I remember like the person who became my supervisor, James Hollings, um, I felt guilty for keeping it sort of from him. I felt guilty for keeping it from my classmates because I knew about these charges and was having to, um, there was a really horrible period where I was having to get taught by Grant in the morning and then in the afternoon try and get down to the court and like find out, like get the, I think it's the charging document. Yeah. Did he ever see you? No, no. Um, there were times where I think he could, like, I was worried that he could have done. But um, a lot of times um, for some of the court appearances, he didn't show. So I'd end up being there and I would, like, my friend who tipped me off about it came with me and we'd go and, like, pound a beer afterwards to just sort of, <laughs> like, process. And bring it. me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I'd just be sweating up in Auckland not knowing what had happened. It was really confusing, though, because we literally didn't know who knew. And this is the thing, because... And that's why they have name suppression is because, like, say he had been found not guilty, then maybe his employer, Massey, never would have found out about it. So we're in this bind because we're like, okay, and we had to really unpick it. We were like, he's bullying and harassing students. We think his behaviour has been exacerbated by the fact that he's facing police charges, which is obviously stressful. Like, what bearing do those things have on each other and who needs to know and who would know and has he told them? And, like, he's a teacher does he have a duty to inform? Like, we just, it was all these questions that we just couldn't really answer. You have I, to, yeah. I guess the other thing is that you don't know uh, who is potentially on his side, right? Yeah. So you don't know if you rung, like, someone who worked with him that they would be like, you know, that there would be some situation where they might tell him or feel some kind of loyalty to him. Isn't that the worst part of those investigations when you have to make that phone call? Yeah. And you all send the email and it's just like you ha you play out in your head like the 17 different ways that it could go down when you tell someone or ask a question. Okay, so the, the, the critical point would have been when he was named, right? You know, when you're able to name him, when the story, when you're able... You had a story that you were working on for the New Zealand Herald, yes. Emily. You're working on stories as well, Kirsty. At what point were you able to say, okay, this is Grant Hannes. This is, this is what's happening. 
Um, so it basically had to wait until the name suppression got dropped. Like I had um, sort of informally talked to the girls in my class who I knew had made a complaint and were really unhappy with how it had been handled, um, but they didn't have necessarily an idea of why I was doing it, and that felt really emotionally shitty because they had a right to know what was going on. Like Grant didn't get name suppression lifted until after he was sentenced. Mm. So it was really, it was like the stories that came out were like a man or like a high profile academic or something has mm. been convicted of assaulting a woman. So it, like we had to wait a, a really long time. Yeah, I think that must have been. So he had resigned in I think November or October citing mental health problems. And everyone I remember think thought that was very strange, but thought that, you know, his outbursts in class like might have been the reason for him doing that. And yeah, it wasn't until later when, you know, everything kind of came together that people were able to fill in those dots. What was it like making those calls that you were talking about, you know, the ones you gamed out with Nikki in the woods when you had to go and ring Massey and say, okay, this is this is what I've got and this is what is going to be published? Um, I had to write what I was going to say because um, I was worried that I was going to, like, tongue-tie myself or whatever. Um, it ended up being... Like, it was a really unpleasant conversation because it wasn't something that I was would have done morally if I hadn't been confined by, like, legal restrictions. It was it was tough, and I remember um, I almost sort of said something at the end, like, do you still like me? <laughs> <laughs> Can we still be friends? Yeah. Will you still be my supervisor next year? I mean, I just, I feel like when I was at journalism school, I was doing stories about, like, the Island Bay Football Club, and like you're right, do you know what I mean? Like the, the, the kindergarten that, gets a rabbit. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is a very intense version of yeah first journalism school. First yeah. story out of journalism school. It was Huge like story. I remember um, some of my friends at the time were like they almost taught you too well. <laughs> like, you ended up you know, and it, what ended up happening that was quite interesting at the end. Um, once I'd kind of not quite throwing them under the bus, but definitely called into account their judgment in terms of not investigating those complaints. Bullying further. allegations. Yes, yeah. yeah. And um, was they ended up giving me a job as a lecturer after that, and I got Hannes's old office. And so it felt what? like a very sort of circle of life. <laughs> it was bizarre. It was a very, yeah, that whole situation was beyond weird. And, yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty ironic but did you feel that the duty of care was there on their part you know like they have a lot to digest obviously they get these phone calls you know it's in the media Kirsty's working on it as well I mean you would have had your own version of those calls yeah I mean I had to do the same and I think particularly because I was working on it as an ongoing story because there were other women <laughs> that's the other thing right that we knew so Emily and I knew all of this information, we couldn't tell anyone. Do you mean other women, other elderly women? Other in the elderly rest? women, yeah. So there's one in particular. The police were really concerned. They were like, this is not a one-off um, incident, even though that's what um, Hannes's lawyer argued at uh, sentencing. They were like, it was just 10 minutes of madness kind of thing, which is, honestly, it's never 10 minutes of madness with sexual assault, like ever, I don't think. Um, but yeah, they knew they had another woman, but she hadn't wanted to take it to court and she didn't want her whole file released. So, and the police were really wary about that because they'd gone in trouble before for releasing police files that weren't, um, hadn't been tested in court. So they would only give me a very small amount of information, but it was enough to say, you know, there was a second woman. And again, all of that stuff was like, who do we tell? When? How's that going to impact this? And yeah, I had to talk to um, James Hollings as well, who's, you know, also a friend, also a really trusted and respected person. In, in a very life. small industry where you're all very yeah, and he, tight. You know, we had this very kind of emotional conversation where I said, of course I wanted to tell you. Like, I just didn't know what to do. Do you There's think, no rules for this stuff. Yeah. Mm. yeah, and I think that sort of speaks to how sexual assault and rape impacts, like it has a ripple effect, right? The, it's not just the person, like the immediate survivor, but it's everyone, interpersonal relationships, you know? It, yeah. So much collateral damage. So that was Emily Rosenthal talking about her experience reporting on our former journo school lecturer, Grant Hannes. 
Can I just say, she is such a boss, Emily, and I don't think she's in journalism anymore, which is like a loss for the rest of us and also just sort of tells you what kind of impact that had on her, the whole thing. It was really traumatic for her, eh? It was like life-changing, I would say. But it's just I find myself in this position where, like, I write about sexual violence all the time. I'm a feminist and... You know, when I'm listening to everything, to, you know, Emily talking, particularly about the, uh, well, only really about the experience of the young reporters at journal school, I'm just like, how much of that is just journalism, you know, and, and like the hard, uh, you, you're expected to be like able to have criticism and to survive in a newsroom environment. But then I'm also like, why am I trying to find an excuse here for him? You know, I just think... Ugh, I just think you just don't want. There's a part of you that just doesn't want to believe that someone that you that you look up to has done that in front of you know, potentially in front of you. It's like survivor guilt, kind of a eh? like you feel guilty that we should have done something about it, and like why were we fine to enter this industry where all of that stuff goes on? And, and then there's like a defensiveness that creeps in as well because we didn't change it. I mean, I feel that, and I feel that that sort of guilt that you're talking about, Kirsty, that is so common. Like we started off saying, you know, we were talking about those DMs we got on Instagram when we put it out on the Tell Me About It um, account for people to share their stories about sexual predators. And I don't know about you, Michelle, but I felt like everybody who answered me, guilt was the thread, like it was the common thread. It was, you know, I should have done something about it. I should have done this. And I feel like that, you know, I feel like that I've been in situations in the past with people where, you know, if I had spoken up, if I hadn't thought, oh, it's just me, it's because of how I behaved, it's because I was drunk or because I, you know, gave the wrong signals. And I don't talk to other women about it, you know, and and maybe I should, but then like, would they believe me? I don't know. Yeah. And then there's the thing where, <laughs> which is even more difficult to talk about, right? Which is where you don't want to do something because it might jeopardize your own livelihood or your career. Like Emily was so brave. Like she basically risked, you know, all that funding, her scholarship, you know, she risked everything for speaking up. And I don't know how many of us can say that we would do that. And that's a complex thing to grapple with. Can I also just come in here and be like, why are we beating ourselves up about this shit? Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank but you. I'm kind of sick of hearing my. I'm kind of sick of hearing myself. Like, oh my god, like, I could have done the thing. Like, why? Where are all the men? Like, are they beating themselves up? Mm. Are they like, oh, I didn't notice. Like, oh, I shouldn't have worn that skirt. You know, I just. I think that this but is, is that like, really the- weird line between like, you know, things being unfair. And also the need for personal responsibility, right? Like the the need to sort of be the best version of yourself and the most ethical version of yourself in a screwed up system. Because it's the system that's not fair. But we can't do that. It's an, it's an impossible ask. Like, and the, the other thing is for survivors, um, even if you do do all the things and you are perfect and you didn't like, you know, smile at someone across a room, there's nothing you can do that's right. It's never right. What about like the the system, like the institutions? Yes, yes, that, that that's the thing, isn't it? Because I mean, look at Emily. Look how brave she had to be, because she's in that system. You know, she says right at the beginning, she's depending on her lively for her livelihood on the institution, and suddenly she finds out this piece of information that you and she had, Kirsty, about the guy who's headed the program. And you know, I, I think in this case, as she outlines it, you know, it all got dealt with. But as a rule, you know, institutions are invested in the status quo. You know, they're invested in the success of successful people. And in a lot of cases, those people are white men, right? Like white men who can walk into rest homes and do what they want. Yeah, I think about that all the time. Like there is a part, so eventually I got some of the police file and in there like repeatedly it's mentioned that Grant so he like he wasn't even supposed to be in this area of the rest home where he committed the crime he was visiting someone else you know how they have like the medical side and then the other side 
he wasn't supposed to be there, so it notes that, that. But he was there all the time. He was there every day, just, like, with his laptop, hanging out in the lounge. And it kept noting that he would, like, always wear a shorts and T-shirt. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. It was like he's just swanning about in his shorts and T-shirt, hanging out at a rest home. It's just, like, your classic white man turn up, do something, be somewhere, and no one even asks Questions what you're up you. to. Eh? I know, and it just They just, just wave at you. You know, hi. Ask you if you want a cup of tea. Like, do you want a sandwich? I just found it really chilling in some way that he could just do that. I don't know. I guess we know now, though. Like, I remember after I finished reporting this story, I talked to the police officer that was in charge of it. Because, you know, he only got six months um, home detention, so he got out quite soon like it was a very light sentence and I talked to the police is that officer. because of like without getting into it Kirsty but is that because of some complications like around the way the trial was like why yeah. is it so little well he never ended up going to trial because they didn't want to put that vulnerable elderly woman through it so he actually pled to like a lesser charge of indecent assault um so yeah he just he just did basically no time I um, mean but yeah the police woman I was like oh you're gonna you know like jokingly I was like you're gonna keep an eye on him and she was just like yes <laughs> So you know that she is driving past that house, eh? Hey? I know? like to imagine her doing that, though. That's so awesome, though, isn't it? Yeah. Just to think of that. You know, she's watching. And, you know, you you were watching and Emily was watching. I mean, I, you know, not to pat you on the back too loudly, but thank God for the fourth state, you know? Yay, journalism! The other thing, though, I think, just one, I just want to make one more last point, which is I think that, like, if you don't, do anything that's not your fault either you know yeah that's a good having something happen to you isn't your fault and not knowing what to do about it and being paralyzed is also not your fault you know there's no one way to behave that paralyzed thing's so true it literally feels like being a rabbit in the headlights and you can't decide which or like you can't decide a pick a path you know which path mm-hmm. to go down because none of them seem to have good endings. And so it is. It's, like, easier not to do anything. You shouldn't be blamed for that because that's what most people do, you know? Oh, it's so good that Emily – thanks so much for Emily for coming on and talking to us, yeah. though, and reliving her trauma for – um yeah, for us. It's basically our hashtag, right? Come on and <laughs> relive your trauma. And on that note, thanks to everyone who um, answered – our messages as well on Instagram and thank you for your DMs thank you to our community for sharing their stories and we'll see you again next week Matewa bye Queenie Queenie don't drop the ball Queenie Queenie don't drop the ball Queenie, Tell Me About It is made for stuff by Bird of Paradise Productions it was produced by me Noel McCarthy and written by me Kirsty Johnston and Michelle Duff Our script supervisor is Eugene Bingham and thanks to Janine Fenwick and Eugene for editorial oversight. Mixed by Mark Chesterman. And our theme tune is Queenie Queenie by Tammy Nielsen, our queen. You can like the podcast and leave a review on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Tell Me About It is made possible by funding from New Zealand On Air. Queenie Queenie don't drop the ball Queenie, Queenie, don't drop the ball. Queenie, Queenie, don't drop the ball. Down come baby, cradle.